Hello and welcome uh, to another Facebook Live here. We're in uh, sunny Southern California. We're about a week ahead of um, Christmas, the tail end of Hanukkah. So I want to welcome everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Sam Sunshine. I'm your host. We're live from OC Sports and Wellness in Foothill Ranch, where we have a direct primary care functional medicine clinic helping people overcome chronic health issues and also getting them pointed in the right direction to achieve optimal health through proper diet and exercise, among other things. Um, so today I'm going to talk about emergency preparedness, something I find that I'm, I'm not prepared for. And uh, frankly, I, I wonder how many people actually uh, take the time to see if they are prepared in case we do have an emergency. And up in Foothill Ranch, we've had two occasions where there's been mandatory evacuations where people have very little time to leave their house because the fires are raging right over the hillside. And it is the job of these um, the sheriff department and the fire department to come and knock on your door at whatever hour and tell you it's time to get your stuff and, and go. So it kind of prompted me to think that People need to be ready and be prepared. And what does that mean? So depending on what happens, it could be that you're staying at your home, or that you're asked to leave your home for a short period of time, or you're asked to leave for a longer period of time. And that's really what we're talking about today. And really the whole point of preparedness is just to make sure you have what's necessary for um, basic needs and also important documents that you should you should have with you and, and medications and so forth. So I'll talk a little bit about those as we move along. If you happen to be listening, please type in your name in the comment box and where you're from. And if you have any questions as we go, please feel free to ask. Um, love answering questions. Um, and again, the whole another reason to be prepared is to reduce major life disruptions and to better recover from these disruptions when they do occur. Um, so recent events like Hurricane Harvey or the Japanese tsunami, it was quite some time ago, the Haiti earthquake, some of you might remember, and, uh, and these California wildfires. Again, we've been um, evacuated a couple times here in Foothill Ranch, but places up like Napa, whether, you know, these, a lot of people, thousands of people lost their homes. Um, they don't have a chance to go back once they leave. And so it's really important to be prepared and know what it is that you need and what things you should have with you in your possession if you're given 10 or 15 minutes to leave your home. Um, and in some cases, if we do have another major earthquake, um, it may be that you're um, out of your home for quite some time. Um, and don't have uh, any notice to, to leave your house. Um, so let's get started. Um, the first thing we need is water. Uh, we need water to survive, and sometimes if we do have an earthquake, um, it may disrupt water supply and the water purification that we get in California and something we take for granted. So how much water do we need on average we need about a gallon a day per person, so one gallon a day per person. And being prepared means different things to different people and different organizations. Some believe that you need at least two weeks worth of supplies, food, water, and so forth, um, and other supplies that will last three days Experts believe you should be prepared for at least two weeks in order to handle the majority of these life-altering events. Some groups like the Red Cross have updated their suggestions. Their site now says a three-day supply for evacuation and a two-week supply uh, if you're at home. So three days of preparedness if you have to evacuate your home and then up to two weeks if you're able to stay at home but maybe don't have water supply, don't have heat. Um, in Southern California, fortunately, we have 
pretty generous weather throughout the year. And um, we don't have seemingly cold weather where we might incur frostbite um, or something more extreme. Okay, so the first thing, water. Um, water, purified water obviously is the best. Um, I do recommend them use a couple props here. But this is a three gallon, so this would be enough for one person. And three gallon is something that uh, a lot of times they have built in handles. So these weigh, again, each gallon of water is about two and a half, 2.2 pounds or so. So it's, uh, no, that's not right. Each liter is about 2.2 pounds. So I don't know, these are about 25 pounds each. So they're able to carry. I think the five gallon ones are just too heavy. I mean, you're going to really have to carry these. These can be lifted and put in the back seat of a trunk of a car. So again, if you're at home and you want two weeks of water, and these are three gallons each, you're gonna need five of these per person. If you have to be evacuated, it would be one of these per person. So that's a little bit more re reasonable. And um, there are different places you can pick these up. A lot of times you can go to a water supply store. Um, I do recommend the the water market, this is in, if you can see the label, this is in Huntington Beach, and they have some of the purest water that's available, um, and you can buy these containers there. So the water market, and um, just a shout out to them in Huntington Beach. So water, I think, is the number one essential. Um, another thing to think about, too, is maybe getting a water, a simple water purification system. So this is something that will filter up to 100,000 gallons of water, and it's something that's fairly inexpensive, and it's a mini water filtration system. It can be kind of glary there, but um, mini water filtration system, I think, is something that's essential. So in case you do have water, but you don't know if it's purified, you can filter the water so that it's tolerable. So again, uh, a gallon a day per person for, for water usually is sufficient. Okay, be prepared for an evacuation, 72 hours, or if you're at home for two weeks supply. Okay, next is food. So you want food that's, uh, you know, something that's tasty, that's non-perishable. So this is the one time that I will say that if you're preparing for an evacuation or to be at home in case of a, a disaster, or an emergency, uh, that you don't shop around the perimeter of a supermarket. Those are all the perishable foods. That's not what we want. We now want to walk into the middle aisles, which we we uh, we get nervous when we walk down there because of all those toxic foods. Um, there are some companies that do offer um, foods for you know for emergencies that are packaged. One company um, that I have here is the Valley. Valley Food Storage, and they have a lot of non-GMO, gluten-free products as well, for those of you who uh, maintain a gluten-free diet. Uh, this is gluten-free buttermilk pancake mix. Um, got quite a few here, I'll just show you a couple. This is a tomato basil soup that they have. Again, you're gonna need water, and then also you're gonna need something to heat. So like a little propane tank, I think would be important in terms of uh, having something where you can boil water, I think would be good. So having a little propane tank with the little propane cartridges like camp that you would use camping. Um, here's some strawberry oatmeal. Again, this is enough for uh, several people for a meal. In terms of calories for food, we need about 1,500 calories per day per person. And that's not too hard to obtain, um, especially if you're eating a highly refined, highly processed food. Again, I would err more towards getting these prepackaged uh, foods that you can put aside. And what I do is keep them in a like a, a bin that has a lid. This is like a uh, Home Depot bin, and this is a five-gallon tub, and you can put things in here. And this has a sealable lid. You can you can actually screw on. And you might have several of these, one containing food, another one containing 
um, some of the other items you may need, um, such as um, you know uh, your propane tanks, or if you have a small grill, a radio is another one that's considered to be important. I think now with cell phones, however, I would just wonder if we need a, a, ra a weather radio, how important that is. When we, if we have cell phones, that will give us a lot of information in terms of up-to-date news, uh, weather reports, and, and so forth. The nice thing about a phone, it also has a flashlight. So a flashlight is super important. But having a flashlight on your phone, most of them, you know, you just turn on flashlight, Siri, and you've got a great flashlight. But what happens if your phone runs out of juice and you don't have electricity? One of the things that I recommend, this is a, a power bank, that's the name of that company, and it's got a USB port, so you uh, want to make sure that's charged. This is a must-have, and it's probably something you probably would keep in your briefcase or your backpack anyway, um, but this is something that in case you have to evacuate and you don't have access to electricity, these will last several days, and they're they're awesome to have. So keeping something like a, a power bank with you would be recommended. All right. So the next thing on the list, other than food and water and a power supply, is um, medications. So if you're someone who takes prescription medications, I think it's a good idea to keep those all in one place and have maybe a tote, tote bag. In the event someone says you need to evacuate, you have your checklist, and you know one of the first things is take your medications with you. Because I think in that moment of extreme anxiety, of thinking you've got to get the kids together, you've got to get um, your um, valuables together, you've got to make sure you've got your water, your food, your, your essentials, your basic essentials. Um, you don't forget prescription medications, that would be important. So making sure that's on your top of your checklist. The other thing you might do is take a picture of each label of your medications and supplements. In case you do happen to leave them behind, you would be able to see if um, you can procure those somewhere else, maybe in a, a nearby city or wherever you end up going, talking to the pharmacy or talking to your doctor and getting a hold of them to refill those prescriptions at the new pharmacy. The other thing is, is documentation. So it's important, again, I think the important documents is not only having a physical copy of those, but also taking pictures of each of these important documents. It may be a, a passport. It could be copies of the deeds or titles to your home, your pink slip to your car, motorcycle, scooter, um, any insurance policies. Be good to have a copy. A lot of times you can access those online. So that's not super important anymore. Birth certificates, some people find it's important to keep their birth certificates or their social sec security cards uh, with their birth certificates and keeping it in a file or, or a manila envelope. And that would be something that you would know in the event of evacuation, you would know where to go, where it would be on your checklist, hopefully towards the top. And, um, and also having a USB uh, jump drive that has pictures of these documents in a folder where you can upload those if you need to. So again, a USB jump drive that has a picture of your medications and these important documents I think is really important. Um, they do also recommend pictures of your family members. Again, one of the big things when um, my dad was reminding me recently of the earthquake up in San Francisco in 19. 88, uh, I believe, uh, it was the first uh, day of the World Series between the Giants and the A's, and um, everything just shut down. And getting in touch with family members, I think, is super important. And for some people, it's uh, uh, it was it was very um, startling for a lot of people. But uh, keep staying connected, know where everybody is. Um, the next thing is maybe having a fire starter or those kitchen uh, butane lighters, I think are very important to have to be able to start a fire if you have a propane, a small propane um, grill that you can heat water or heat food, um, you gotta be able to start those. And so having one of those um, but butane lighters, I think is important. Some people even have fire starters um, that you can get at 
places uh, like Home Depot or Lowe's. Next, uh, light. I think having a source of light is really key, especially at night. So I think portable lanterns that are battery operated are, are important. Um, and because some of the things you might have require batteries, having some uh, nine volt as well as some D and uh, double and AAA batteries in your kit as well, especially if it, you know, whatever electrical or battery operated um, products you have, make sure you have replaceable batteries for those. I can't tell you how many times I've used headlamps um, before triathlons and you go there and it doesn't work because the batteries are dead. Um, so, you know, making sure you bring extra batteries for headlamps and portable lanterns, super important. Um, again, you can have checklists. Some of these are very extensive. There's one medical checklist that's 145 items. Again, it is uncommon to have to deal with an emergency that would pull you from your home or destroy your home um, or require you to be evacuated. Again, we, we've had two times in the past month where this has happened here in Foothill Ranch. Um, fortunately, um, I don't think we've lost any homes in Foothill Ranch. I know other places nearby have, unfortunately. And of, of course, up in the up in the Bay Area and uh, Napa and Sonoma, different story. I mean, um, very horrible. The, the fires have just created uh, devastation there. So again, we can't be prepared enough, um, but I think it's gotta be somewhat simplified and obtainable, but it's something we should think about doing sooner than later and maybe block out a few hours on a weekend or maybe your family together and just rehearse uh, what you plan to do in case something like this were to happen. Some of you have had the, have had to do that already. So you kind of already know like, wow, we really weren't prepared and we didn't know where to go. We didn't know what to take and having a checklist. Again, a lot of these checklists or emergency preparedness checklists are available online and you can make up your own um, because certain things don't apply to everybody. Uh, the basic needs, however, do, and that's water and food. I think also having um, functional smartphone with a charger, key, having lights, uh, key. Um, so, and then again, medications and um, things like that. Um, it gets into different tools, um, having local and emergency information, which I think is easy to find. I don't think that's that critical unless you lived in a more rural area where you're not quite sure where the hospital is or if you're traveling. But again, if you're traveling and you incur an emergency, it would be unusual for you to be prepared for that. But if you're at home and something happens, uh, it, it, again, it's something we should, we should think about because things have hit close to home. Okay, so that's kind of, that's kind of it for my emergency preparedness. Again, something to think about, carving out time with the family, doing a, a rehearsal where you have everything together. Oh, one other thing is, you know, cash. Some people recommend up, having up to $300 in cash, mostly in smaller bills like fives and tens, or whatever you, you think might be important. And that may be something you have in the house, or you have in that an envelope, or you have your deeds and your pink slips and your passports and your birth certificates, maybe those are all in one folder with some with an envelope of some cash. Something to think about. Or if you have a safe in your house, you can put all that into a safe and you just know in the event of an evacuation, that's your first place you go. You get your toiletries, medications, and you have already set aside your food. Again, about 1,500 calories per person per day. Uh, not too hard to kind of figure out. That's not a lot but it should be sufficient. And then having a gallon of water per person per day. Okay, so that's all I really have. I don't know if anybody uh, has any questions you'd like to ask. Please feel free to comment in the comment box. I know you're out there. You're just being shy. So the next thing just to talk about, again, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We had Pfizer start to release their 
mRNA vaccine this week, and Moderna will be releasing their vaccine uh, in the next couple of days, I believe. Um, there is some concern about the validity or value of the vaccine because it was quote unquote rushed. Um, I want to kind of clarify things a little bit. Um, again, these vaccines still had to go through phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Um, and it, it's really a testament to the science that's available today that a vaccine could get approved by the FDA this quickly. They did go through the necessary steps. It is a valid vaccine. It has been tested in humans, tens of thousands so far, um, before it was released by the FDA or approved by the FDA, although it is under an emergency use authorization, so they didn't have to go through all the steps. They were also paid in advance for making the vaccine, which kind of lifted a lot of the constraints on a vaccine company because they've got to either apply for grants or come up with money uh, through venture capital funding to have enough money to, to create a vaccine and to test the vaccine. And the government was able to step up and, and help, at least with the Moderna vaccine, they sponsored them. Um, so there are about 60% of people that if they were given the opportunity to get the vaccine would get it today. There's about 20% of people who are concerned about the vaccine and think it may be uh, dangerous. And there's about 20% of people that are kind of in the middle and they're not quite sure. Um, time will tell. I think, again, the first round of vaccines are going to go towards the vulnerable, which are the elderly, and also the frontline workers, doctors who are taking care of COVID patients directly, primarily in the emergency rooms across the country. Um, nursing homes will be some of the first recipients of the vaccine. And I think for those people who are at high risk, uh, the vaccine is essential. At this point, there is no mandatory vaccine requirement. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if mandatory vaccines are imposed by, by schools, by airlines, by hospitals. Time will tell. Right now, the rate limiting factor is quantity of vaccines. We don't have enough to go around at this point. So we will see come the end of the spring, early summer, where, where we stand on mandating vaccinations for, for everybody. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about that, but I do think the, the vaccine, the scientists who develop vaccine, vaccines have gone through the necessary steps to ensure the safety and the efficacy of the two vaccines that are, have been FDA approved so far. And then there are four other companies working on different types of vaccines, and those are in different phases of clinical trials. And so we'll see. But right now the efficacy seems to be in the 94 to 96% range. We know vaccines like the measles, mumps, rubella, it's like 96 to 98% effective. So again, very good um, efficacy with these two COVID-19 uh, vaccines. So if you have any questions, you can ask me, reach out. Again, um, if you have any questions, otherwise I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off uh, for today's Facebook Live. And if you are a member of the DPC, we're gonna continue to offer these Facebook lives and, and, and talks in the, in the new year. And if you're somebody who's interested in hearing these talks, let us know um, as well. We're at OC Sports and Wellness. Our phone number is 949-460-9111. And without further ado, wish you a, a great day, great Friday, and great weekend. We'll see you next week.